Hello, I'm Charna Davis Wiese and welcome to UCF Profiles. Forget about the theme park capital of the world. The Orlando area is just as famous for food. Fast food, franchise food, fabulous food. Say hello to Dr. Chris Muller, who is, you have so many credentials and <laughs> you're known all over the world. If, if I went into it, we'd be here the whole half hour would be up. I so, I'm so glad that you're here. Well, thanks. And I, I love this topic because I love food. I love places that serve food. I love the people who are into food. And you have it in your blood. I mean, yes. this is something that goes back for generations. This wasn't a surprise career choice for you, was uh, it? I'm fourth generation. Uh, my my great-grandfather on my mother's side was named Christopher. Last name was Clee, but he owned a tavern in Brooklyn at the turn of the last century uh, in the early 1900s. Um, in fact, he died. Um, he died uh, working there, and then my my great grandmother became the chief cook for the YWCA's of uh, New York City. And my grandmother grew up on YWCA campgrounds, uh, so it was really cool. It's just uh, absolutely amazing. We've got this, and 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 you're like I am. You're sentimental, and you like to keep things. And this is not your. This is not an ordinary plate. This has no. a lot of meaning. Actually, this yeah, this sits on. This was a plate from my great grandfather's tavern, uh, the the restaurant they had in Brooklyn on Knickerbocker Avenue back in the early 1900s. And so I keep it as a, um, a memory of the four generations. It goes and back so over there were years. German restaurants. There was a deli. My great aunt, uh, my tante Minnie, had uh, with my uncle Albert uh, had three German restaurants in all through the New York area. Uh, so. Uh, there was that. My grandparents owned a, uh, a delicatessen, uh, which in German is a, a small eat. So, so there is, I love this. We're going we're gonna to take very good care yeah. of it during this half mm -hmm. hour. So there is 15-year-old Chris. And he wants to get into the food business, and your whole career started with a lie, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, I, I went down, I was uh, very short as a kid, so I was about four foot uh, two and, <laughs> and 15 years old. And in New York State, you have to be 16 to be able to get a, a job, uh, working papers. And I went into the local Carvel, the ice cream stand, and um, I knew he needed somebody, and I said, I'd like to have a job. He said, are you 16? And I said, absolutely. And he looked at me, and here I was, four foot two. I could barely see over the counter. And he said, you're really 16? I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I'll hire you. You bring me the working papers. Well, by the, the um, middle of my junior year, when I turned 16, I was managing the place. I had a key. I was locking it up, and, and I became great friends with the family. And So So you knew right then that this was it for you. I, and there you started with a brand. <laughs> a brand Carvel and, and a branded ice cream and, and just had a, a love for it. And then when I went to college, um, I was hired as a, a bartender in a family uh, bar right on campus. They had never hired anybody uh, outside of the family. And I worked there for three years. I catered all the um, sporting events with uh, for, um, the trustees. Um, I was the bartender at the faculty club when I was in college. Um, so I've, yeah, I've been doing this forever. So you are an expert in franchises and multi-units and restaurants. brands, chain restaurants. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, I, I, I had read, as we talked about, I had read uh, quotes from you in a, basically an article on you in Vogue magazine. Mm -hmm. It was about two years ago. Yeah. And it was so interesting when I saw how this is the mecca. This is the, this is the proving ground, this area. And I remember, as I said to you, I, I, I said to my husband that night, did you know that Orlando is the fast food franchise place of the world? And he's like, oh, yeah, really? Mm -hmm. We live close to 436. That's it's it. Like, uh, well, there's actually over 4,000 restaurants in the uh, Orlando metro area. It's one of the denser places in the country. Um, a, good, a good way to look at it is there's about three or four cities in the United States where uh, chain restaurants develop. Uh, it's here, Columbus, Ohio, and the Lexington, Kentucky area, where the, uh, Wendy's and Yum are based, uh, based. Dallas is another one. And Orlando, because of Darden, and there's about 130 corporate headquarters in the Central Florida area, all the way from Ormond Beach to Tampa. And what that does is creates a density of professional managers who also want to strike out on their own. The, the folks that started um, um, Stonewood Grill, are all right. former um, Olive Garden people. Uh, Craig Miller, who is the head of the CEO of Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, uh, grew up in, in Central Florida, uh, went to UCF, worked for Joe Lee at uh, Darden, uh, went off and did other things, was the CEO of Pizzeria Uno. Now he's the head of Ruth's Chris. Uh, they've just moved their headquarters to 
uh, Heathrow. And in the history of food, this is kind of relatively new. I read that book, Fast Food Nation, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, talking about how it was such a newfangled idea, mm -hmm. and, and, and a lot of it is based on the fact that we're a very mobile society. We're sitting behind the wheel a lot. <laughs> and I, actually, uh, it's a post-World War II phenomenon. The restaurant business that we know today uh, really started in the early 1950s. 1952 was a, a big year, 54 in that range. Uh, that's when McDonald's, Burger King, which started in Miami. Uh, um, I remember that chicken. when I was mm -hmm. a little girl in Miami. I remember I was telling my kids that the ham the king was sitting on top of a burger mm -hmm. and it had the little drawings of the sesame seeds. That's and it. I was absolutely mesmerized by that when I was a little girl. But then we got the hampers, they didn't look like that. No, they didn't look like <laughs> that at all. Uh, up until 1968, you used to walk up to the, uh, all the fast food places and, and only in, in uh, the middle 60s did they actually make a dining room. Um, still. Uh, most of the, the food goes through the drive through window or the takeout. Uh, Why does it work here, Dr. Miller? Well, we are a transient population. A lot of people move here. Uh, one of the things that happens when you move, say, from upstate New York or Detroit, um, is you look for things that are going to make you feel familiar, uh, and that's brands. I ate at a McDonald's mm -hmm. in London. You just, you just <laughs> want to have that taste of home, and, and part of it is that recognition of something you know you can trust. And that's what brands are. It doesn't matter whether it's UCF, um, whether it's the toothpaste you buy, um, cars you buy, we, we like brands. And in the restaurant business, the multi-unit chain restaurant business has grown up with the American population. And as we've got more sophisticated in our dining, we've also looked for things that are familiar. It's a sort of paradox that we like what we know and we like to try new things again. So. And not only are you an expert on this, you're, 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 you're using your expertise to give to other, to students. Mm -hmm. You could do anything you want anywhere in the world, but you're teaching. So that tells me you're teaching because you really like to teach. Well, teaching is a really great thing. And, and part of, even when I was in the restaurant business when I was a kid, um, I had an owner one time as a, when I was a general manager of a restaurant in Boston say that uh, I was a better teacher than a manager. Um, and I was teaching him how to run his business better. The um, part of teaching is that idea that you get to reach out and touch people in the future. Um, a few years ago, I used to teach at Cornell University at the hotel school there. Uh, I had a class in restaurant operations. Just last week, I got a phone call out of the blue from a, uh, a kid who was in the class of 1992. And he opened three rest has opened since then three restaurants in California. And he called me up because he saw uh, my name in some newspaper, USA Today or something. Mm -hmm. And he said, I've just got to call Dr. Muller. So he, he called me on the phone and wanted to tell me how influential that class was in his getting together. His partner was in the class. They've taken all the lessons from that. Now, what's that, 15 years or 13 years later? And he's still f talking about it and felt compelled to go and call and tell me about Much it. Much better than the paycheck. <laughs> yeah, well, it would have been nice if he put me on the board. But um, <laughs> no, what's nice about it is that, uh, you know, when the, um, oftentimes we talk about teaching as you reach the future. Uh, I, it's almost every week I get some kind of contact from a former student saying how they were using the things that I had helped them learn. And that's really a, a gratifying piece. I imagine coming into a college like the Rosen the Rosen School, mm -hmm. which is so fabulous oh, it's wonderful. And, and, and so amazing that people might think, oh yeah, I've, I've worked at McDonald's, I've worked at Carvel, I'm going to be in the restaurant business. And unless they're a foodie like I am and have watched Rocco, mm -hmm. <laughs> Spirito, and watched the restaurant, and watched Mario Batali, I don't know how real that is. It's much more, much more complex to actually being in the restaurant business than just saying, I can really cook. <laughs> well, and, and that's what, um, there's always this, this thing that everybody wants to own their own restaurant because they're good entertainers. I can cook chicken better than anybody else. Or, uh, it is a, a very complex business because you're dealing with the public. Uh, the customer is really the one who decides what your menu is. Um, and, and one of the things that makes the Rosen School unique is that we've identified that as being a complex uh, professional topic, um, we've just created a, a BS, a Bachelor of Science degree in restaurant and food service management, not on the culinary side, but from the management side. Because mm -hmm. um, if you think about all of the things that a restaurant is, um, even a McDonald's, which across the, the country does about $1.8 million in sales, mm -hmm. um, has a staff could have 50 or 60 people working there, uh, will serve upwards of 1,000 people a day. Um, it's a very complex interaction between the, what the customers bring in as expectations. Uh, you have to deal with human resources and, and uh, motivation. Uh, you have an economic model where you have very fine um, profit mi margins, 
McDonald's and Burger King uh, talk about a penny profit. They make, they make a penny on their hamburger sales. Um, probably a lot more on their beverages, though. <laughs> uh, but it's but it's it's still a very thin margin business. You just have to you have to you have to work in volume. Then. Yeah, there was a great uh, um, a great quote that I saw in a Hardee's uh, a number of years ago. It was uh, over the back of the the pickup window, and it said, uh, "We always remember that you can go someplace else." And if you think about the choice, you know, four thousand restaurants. Think of how many places you can go to have lunch today, uh, and that each one of them has to has to be able to attract. Um, customers and give more value and uh, create a, a, a better dining experience. Uh, right. it's and it's not only complex. the food, the proprietor as well. I, you know, there, my husband and I have been here many years and we actually went to this one restaurant, very popular in town, mm -hmm. uh, family owned, um, for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Every Thursday night we'd go there. It was our thing. And then finally one day we realized they keep treating us like they've never seen us before. Mm -hmm. The food is fabulous. It's a really chic place to go. And we just, you know, one day we thought, yeah, we're not coming back. Because they don't recognize you. They, they're not even a smile, not even a, you know, <laughs> nothing, nothing really big. But I'm sure I'm not the only person that feels that way. Well, remember Cheers? What yeah. was, you know, Cheers had one of the, the greatest um, uh, Diddy, you know, that little theme song. And it was, you go to Cheers because that's where everybody knows your name. And even the place that's called Cheers that wasn't Cheers mm -hmm. is probably uh, probably <laughs> doing well because of that. People oh, well, think actually, it was go very popular before them. then. Uh, but yeah. it, it's the idea that, that you walk into your corner place, the old public house. It's the, it's the place, uh, you know, uh, Starbucks is built on the idea of uh, that a Starbucks is the third place. That's actually in their mission statement. The third place is it's not home and it's not work. It's the place where you go to see your friends and other human because beings. Because you're breaking bread together. Yes, it's it's the most social uh, business. Um, I tell uh, students usually at the, the end of the semester, I have a thing, uh, the kids joke is the sermon. And because um, <laughs> I say that we, what we do is we stand with our arms outstretched and say, welcome, come, let me make you whole, let me make you better, uh, let me restore you. The original restaurant uh, term, a restaurant is actually a, a bowl of broth that was used as a restorative to make people healthy really? in the 1700s in Paris. And, and what we do is we want you to come in, spend an hour, an hour and a half, and forget your outside cares. Sit and, and be with great people, whether you came with them or you meet them when you're there. Um, relax, have a good meal, feel better, be restored, and then go back into the world. Because otherwise like, you could drive through and eat behind the wheel. And, and people <laughs> do that too, unfortunately, for the for full service restaurants. But um, um, eating behind the wheel, you know, we love to eat in the car. And, um, I could tell uh, by the floor of my car. Yeah, I told my kids to clean the car because I have three small children. I said, you know, if we ever got stuck stuck in a snowstorm, we, we wouldn't we would not starve. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, from the old French fries. Harry Balzer is a, a, a restaurant analyst for, with a company called uh, NPD, and he made a presentation here in Orlando uh, last fall. And he said he asked the, the group of restaurant executives, "What's the number one uh, growth appliance in the United States for, uh, for restaurants?" And they guessed, you know, stoves and grills and all this sort of stuff. And he said, no, it's the, it's the little button on the driver's <laughs> side window. Uh, because the number one important appliance is the, wi the automatic window opener. We eat about 22% of all restaurant meals in our car. And that's really changed. And I was reading in the Fast Food Nation book that, that, that McDonald's actually uses satellite technology to take mm -hmm. pictures of the, the landscape, the changing geography according to where were the best place to put mm -hmm. it, where most people are going to drive by. Uh, you know, restaurant, restaurant site selection is a real science. Uh, they use um, advanced uh, geographical information systems, satellite technology, GPS. Uh, it, all, it really grew because of Ray Kroc from McDonald's. Uh, in the early days, he actually used to hand select uh, all of the sites. He would Didn't drive. Did have an, a really big pamphlet too that you had to read before you used to work there? Oh, it's still, they have uh, almost four feet of, uh, of operating manuals that you have to learn, go through. But he would actually drive around in cars and, and, and uh, helicopters and planes and pick. He would look for church steeples, uh, was one of, the, one of the guarantees, because he said where there's a church, there's going to be people. And he would, they, they were known for tying up uh, land in 99-year leases where there was no population, because he knew that's where the people were going to move. That's where the spread was going uh, to be. And, um, was was legendary. Now McDonald's I imagine had the best if thing. you see a McDonald's going up in the middle of nowhere, buy property. Absolutely, there. <laughs> and people do. They they still look for that. And McDonald's um, years ago had a, was very very guarded about how they they selected things. They changed to a much more advanced computer system and and revealed some of the things they had done. But uh, one of the things was to go for other companies was to find out where McDonald's was going to go and go across the street. All of this that we take so for granted 
today is all innovation. Uh, rotisserie chicken has been rotisserie chicken forever. Hamburger. Pizza. <laughs> yeah. McDonald's didn't invent the hamburger. Starbucks didn't invent the coffee shop. Uh, pizza Hut didn't invent pizza. What we did see is, is a new way of presenting it to people. Seasons 52 in, in Orlando, Darden's latest thing, Fabulous. is fine dining at casual theme prices. It's, it's probably one of the most innovative restaurants. Love the little desserts. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, but nothing in, the, in Seasons 52 isn't in other restaurants before them. What the people at Darden have been able to do is create a restaurant concept that is, is unique because it's built on all of these other things before it. And uh, innovation gave us fast food. Uh, innovation gave us um, the kitchen brigade. Uh, franchising. Uh, restaurants are the largest portion of the franchise industry worldwide. But restaurant companies didn't invent franchising. Franchising goes back to the Singer sewing machine in the 1850s. And actually, uh, General Motors, uh, the um, franchise system, Howard Johnson, uh, remember Howard Johnson's oh, restaurant? Yeah, with their little pointy yeah. ice cream cones. And, and, and <laughs> actually, cream. that was that was a, an interesting piece was the you know, the triangular ice cream cones. Mm -hmm. uh, but Howard Johnson was a real real man. He had an ice cream stand in Quincy, Mass, uh, and that people used to want to buy his products. He had saltwater taffy, hot dogs, and um, fried clams and ice cream. I remember the fried clams. Uh, and, oh, and so what he did was, laid. I oh. like some right now. <laughs> and what he, but what he did is he started offering uh, franchise opportunities to other people to put restaurants, uh, Howard Johnson's restaurants, along the old Route 1. Route 1 went from Maine to Miami. It was the U.S. Route 1. It was the Maine North-South Road. And he created this group of restaurants that, so that you could drive all the way down the East Coast and stop at a, a Howard Johnson's and have the same standardized product. Now, he ca actually is credited with coming up with the idea that this was a chain of restaurants, that he, each one that had he to be like... He actually used the term. He actually used the term chain of restaurants. And if you look at the way it was, it was put together, uh, that, was, that was a link of, of chains, and it was only as strong as the weakest link. So he was, he was um, in, incredibly aggressive about standards. Mm -hmm. You had to buy the, the products. You had to only use things that he approved. And that was in the 1920s. Um, uh, the, and he based that entire model on General Motors, on how General Motors had sold franchises to motor car dealerships and said if that was good enough for, for General Motors, didn't it's good enough McDonald's, for me. Didn't McDonald's, didn't, didn't um, Kroc also base this on uh, car, the, the Ford company? Or, or well, they, when they, they did the, con the, the actual, um, con not conveyor belt, the assembly line system well, of putting the food together? Absolutely. The, the, another innovation of uh, Henry Ford and the River Rouge assembly line. Um, what they, the McDonald's, the fast food business, really is innovative because it takes a manufacturing approach to the production of food. Uh, and creates a new model, um, and but it's not something that you know. One day Ray Kroc, or the, actually the McDonald's brothers before him, he bought the concept mm -hmm. from two brothers out in California. Um, what they were able to do is create systems based on Frederick Taylor's scientific management principles, again from the turn of the century, uh, that every man would do one job, um, uh, and. I'm if picturing we, those old cartoons, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, <laughs> well, and, and they studied, uh, you know, time motion studies and all that sort of stuff. And actually, if, if you want to see a really cool link to this whole thing, back at the turn of the last century, uh, the restaurants used to be craft-based. People would be specialists in certain things, but they'd cook the entire meal for kings and, and um, uh, noblemen. And there was a, a chef in France, uh, Auguste Escoffier. Uh, who combined with a maitre d', Cesar Ritz, names we recognize, Escoffier is a, a synonymous with um, fine dining. Mm -hmm. He created a thing called the Kitchen Brigade. He took a military organization uh, and a hierarchical organization. So if you went into, a, if, even today, if you go into a French kitchen, the chef will have the tallest hat, he'll have black pants on, a white jacket with uh, chevrons and, and stripes and things. And then each step down, the sous Definitely chef, a hierarchy. Well, well, you can see what it, whose job is whose, all the way down to the, the dishwashers who will all be in white. And in that French brigade, each cooking station had a special function. So the grilleur would be somebody who would just do, my French is terrible, but <laughs> they, would, they would just do grill and the, and the um, uh, Legumer would just do vegetables, and a poissonier would just do fish, and uh, there was an abayar, a barker, who would, who would call out all the orders when they came in, usually a chef. Well, if you take those designs of a hierarchical structure and a group of people doing a specialized task, and then go into a McDonald's or a Burger King, and look at what they're actually doing, the, it, McDonald's is actually 
a systemized fine dining restaurant because you have the person who's the grill man, you have the person who, uh, who's a beverage person, you have someone doing fried fish and, and cooking, cooking uh, the, the um, french fries. That's the, the uh, uh, same role that Escoffier designed in, in the 1900s is one of the last places we still see it is in fast food. Uh, if, if you remember, uh, you said you remember the early Burger Kings. Remember when you used to go to a Burger King, there was the, the microphone, special orders don't upset us, that, they, uh, that you would order and they would actually yell the order to the line. I remember, hold I remember Hold the pickles, the hold the lettuce. Oh. Uh, and that was, that's the old Abba That's the old barker ordering the kitchen to, to prepare food to order just as they did in there. So it's way more than just I can really cook. And you can, you can mm -hmm. learn this in, in the Rosen School. And That's there's other thing when you talk about ma having a franchise. It, the, the restaurant has to reach a particular point of success before you so, know that it's time to open the second one or the absolutely. third one. Um, it's a, it, you need to show that the prototype is, is working, that it's profitable, that you've worked out all the kinks. Um, it's, a, it's a very... Uh, complex business model um, and because it's it's if you think about it it's instantaneous when you go into a restaurant you were talking about um, the, the restaurant that you've been going to for 13 years um, and the food is great but the service is there's no warmth to it well it's not just the the food that you eat but the complexity of the service piece uh, and how are you recognized by the waiter or waitress? Did the, did the food come out exactly when I want it? Some, some people want to eat in 45 minutes, some want to eat in an hour and a half. Uh, you have to be able to judge that, so you have this, this group of uh, uh, variables that are really not under your control as an operator, they're under the control. And the you may not even know what they're going to be. Oh, you just yeah. have to almost have a sense of it. Yes. So you, after doing all this, and you travel all around the world, and you mm -hmm. study all these things, you couldn't help but go back into the business, could you? No. <laughs> uh, I, I, um, I keep hoping it would go away, but I, I had a restaurant in Cape Cod, on Cape Cod in 1980, mm -hmm. and it was a very successful failure. <laughs> where we had uh, lots of customers I and no money. I love that. Yeah. Because we talk about that a lot in this, that, that failures aren't necessarily failures. They're, no. They're the, the step to the next success. It, it cost me you know, some money. I had an IRS tax lien against me for seven years, but um, I didn't go bankrupt and I learned a lot of lessons. And, and because of that, I was able to learn more from my failure than many people did from their success. Um, but it tuition. was- Tuition, it's like your tuition. It was, it was a very expensive MBA is the way I describe it. <laughs> um, and and um, I waited a number of years and then I had a chance to, to put together a package of uh, a partnership with some, some of my former students, two from UCF and one from Cornell. Um, and I looked at the new town center developments and said that Central Florida has got, got an opportunity. And I made the plunge and opened a restaurant in Maitland. And how, I know how it's doing because I've been there and I love it. It's, it's very, people love the food. Are you, are you glad to be back in? Yes, uh, and, and I use it as a teaching tool. Uh, we go you know, all the way back to the, the teaching piece. Um, I realized that my stories were older than some of my students, uh, <laughs> since most of them were born in the late 1980s, and my restaurant stories were from, the you know, from 1980. Um, what I've been able to do is uh, use it in my leadership class uh, on dealing with partners. Uh, I'm going to uh, do some um, classroom stuff on, on developing and, and growing a concept. Um, we use it in the brand management class. Uh, and it's also innovative because it's a Zabistro, I'll uh, give you the plug. No. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's pizza, but it's not, it's not your everyday. No, everything I'm, comes out of it. It's uh, still cold the next, it's good cold the next morning, but it's not your everyday no. pizza. And it's not, uh, actually we thought it was gonna be a pizza. My, my uh, daughter Elizabeth, Lizzie, uh, actually was the one who, who came up with the name. I had, I had taught, wanted to call it Pizza Bistro and everybody I talked to said that was an awful name. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, oh, she's fabulous. Well, that's the <laughs> slang of, for pizza in the Northeast was let's have some za. You mm -hmm. know, you just drop the thing off, sort of a, a college y kind of thing. And, and I said to the, the girls uh, one afternoon, let's, can I get you some za for dinner? And Lizzie said, that's the name of the restaurant, Za Bistro. And so uh, she really came up with the name. Mm -hmm. And we thought we were going to sell a lot of pizzas. And salads and all, it, all kinds of we other don't stuff. S the pizza's about 25%. It's mostly entrees and salads and sandwiches. It's really good, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's really nice. And, and Maitland's a, a great community, so we've been really fortunate to, to be there. Um, and, it, and it is uh, good for, for me, I think, uh, personally, what's been most rewarding is that if, uh, if I were teaching fine arts uh, and I were a creative writer, I would want to write books and short stories or poetry. If I were a, an artist, I'd paint or sculpt. Uh, if I were in biochemistry, you know, all these fancy uh, images here, mm -hmm. I'd be doing biochemistry or simulation, I'd be doing something like that. 
I teach restaurant management, I think it, it adds um, a certain amount of credibility. And it keeps you to keeps you really on target. It keeps you really on top of things as a, as they're changing. Oh, it's it's a and that just keeps reminding me how complex the business is. Um, but when I talk about it in the classroom to the students, they know that I'm not just talking about something theoretical. I'm actually doing it. We've been open for two years, um, which is a, a good time. I, I did a study on restaurant failure back in the early '90s, and one of the things we determined was that restaurants uh, who make it or which make it to their third year have a, about a 60% chance of going for 10 years. So the object is to get as close to, uh, to the third year as you can, because uh, that's when you know, it, things look better. And it is still a risky business, and we're in our third year, so I'm feeling pretty Before good. we close, we have such a short time left. Oh. Any words of advice to someone who's thinking, I really want to do this? And I, 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 any words of advice for them about the restaurant um, biz? There's an old saying that you can, anybody can make a small fortune in the restaurant business. All you have to do is start with a large fortune. <laughs> uh, I, my advice to them is have lots of money and hire really strong unit managers, which is what I did. Yeah, in fact, that, that I don't work there. Did you see that Mario Batali special about his mm -hmm. newest restaurant? Ten million dollars to open yeah. the door. Oh, it, it's and they ran expensive. out of money. And they <laughs> ran out of money. Uh, and that's what you know. Rocco's problem wasn't the the money per se. The the real uh, was the man who gave him. The money. Well, it was you know, actually Jeffrey is a very successful uh, restaurant company guy, and Rocco just didn't they do it didn't, in the store. They didn't they didn't mesh well together at all. Dr. Muller, thank you great. so much. Thank we you. just flew by. Thanks for bringing your plate. Oh yes, <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> I'm Thanks. so glad you joined us. Thank you. It was great. I'm Charna Davis-Wiese. We'll see you again next time on UCF Profiles.